Good. Right. When do I have to be done? <laughs> when do I have to be done? When you're finished. Hey, <coughs> you know, you got a retired master chief and a retired pastor up here. You guys settle uh -uh, in and be here tired. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> get, get, get more coffee going. Get, get some coffee yeah. And, yeah. and order in some lunch. And, and, uh, do I have any fellow submariners in the audience? Everyone's tall here. Huh? You're the tallest one I'm the here. tallest one here, and you can tell by uh, my lack of hair that uh, I rub most of it off. <laughs> well, again, thank you and, and the museum for having me come back. Um, the paper that you have um, shows a very embarrassing picture of, uh, of a very young, innocent man, a young man, um, who at the time was about 23 years old. Jerry, will you correct that innocent part? Yeah. <laughs> that, that evolved, uh, that, e that uh, evaporated uh, shortly thereafter. Um, born in Elkhart, Indiana, raised in Michigan. Born in Michigan? Huh? Born in Michigan. Grand Rapids. We, uh, my dad was uh, a World War II veteran. He served on a uh, mini aircraft carrier. Uh, named the uh, USS Macassar Straits, and uh, he got in in 1943. And his job was to ferry men and troops back from Iwo Jima back to the United States. Um, on the way over, they were to bring fuel and some other things. And so Dad served about two and a half, three years. I have many uncles that served. I have a brother that did uh, three years in the army and he served in Korea uh, in the 60s and uh, dad raised us to uh, serve our country uh, to always give back something to the country uh, that has given us uh, so much and do it in some way and um, so I, I um, gradu graduated from high school I went to uh, Western Michigan University uh, the innocent part was well gone before that picture on that piece of paper. I had a really good time at Western. Um, we came to an agreement. I wouldn't come back, and they wouldn't let me back in. <laughs> um, I had a good time. Uh, but there I met uh, the love of my life, if I can put it that way. And Carol and I have been married 41 years uh, this June. And um, I got smarter as I got older. I ended up getting a bachelor's and a master's degree. And, and uh, I just was not mature enough to uh, go through college at that time. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went back home and I worked for my dad's company, uh, a multi million dollar laundry and dry cleaning outfit in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I was working my way up into the company. And I woke up one day and I said, you know, somebody near and dear to me is going to have to die for me to move up in this company. And uh, Carol and I had been married about a year. And I became very rough. And she said, you have been, you have talked about joining the service since I've known you. And she goes, let's go talk to the recruiter. That gives you an idea of how wonderful my wife is because she's the one who literally talked me into going down to see the recruiter. And uh, walked in and the recruiter looked at me like some young married, didn't know much. And I took the ASVAB <coughs> test and he came back uh, almost drooling. Um, and he said, what? program would you like to do, you can do anything that you want. You scored that high on the test. My grades in high school and college would tell you differently. Um, but I decided that I would go learn how to operate uh, and maintain a nuclear power plant. And uh, six years later I would get out of the Navy and go back to Benton Harbor, Michigan and work in the civilian nuclear power industry and live happily ever after. So, uh, 40 years later, as I stand here in Broomfield, Colorado, obviously I made a different choice uh, as we went through. So I joined the Navy and um, literally left on a bus 
to Detroit on July 4th, uh, 1978. And uh, went through the, all the stuff at the station down there that night. Uh, or the next night, caught a train to Chicago and went to Duke. And uh, there's kind of where the story begins. The picture that we have up here is a, a Trident missile submarine. It's called the Ohio class. And I was telling Ed earlier that this kind of depicts the beginning and the end of my Navy career. Uh, the first ship, the first boat um, submarine that I served on was a Trident missile submarine. The last one I served on was a Trident missile submarine. So the USS Florida and was the first one. And Ed, go ahead. Oh yeah, there's some propaganda. Um, for the silent service and, and Pride Runs Deep and all the other things that go along with that. Go ahead. Um, I have to tell you that uh, always coming home was uh, good. Um, it, it, uh, that, that's, what, that's what coming home was all about. And there's other pictures that I'll show uh, as we go through this. But, um, no matter how long we were gone, that's the kind of reception most of us got when we came back. It was, um, it was awesome. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, um, so... <laughs> <laughs> Great Lakes Naval Base, uh, otherwise known as boot camp, um, what was very interesting. I was 23 years old when I went to boot camp. I was a good five years older than most of the kids in our, most of the people in our company. And um, interesting that the uh, gunner's mate first class, uh, Brown, was our drill instructor, and he made me the educational petty officer of the recruit company. Um, little did he know he kind of set something in motion for me at that time. My master's degree is in education, and I <coughs> love teaching, and um, again, he he kind of set some things in motion, unbeknownst to, to me and him, as we went through. Um, boot camp was like that if you got in trouble, if you didn't follow the rules, if you didn't learn how to play the game. And um, it, it quickly became apparent, uh, if you watch enough of the clowns in the company, you learn what not to do. And um, when I graduated from Great Lakes, it was uh, early September. Um, Chicago was hot in August. And I remember uh, thunderstorms looking out the uh, windows. The pollution was so bad in Chicago at that time that the lightning was not lightning color. It was all green and orange because of the pollutants in the air. And those were the kinds of things that, uh, that I remember about boot camp. Other than that, it was just learning Navy speak. So, go ahead. Um, part of part of training um, for us was to learn to do these two things. The picture on the left, um, when you're at sea, you are the fire department, um, specifically in the submarine. Um, more surface ships literally have a fire department, damage control, and then have a division where they take care of things. In a submarine, everybody is trained in damage control. So we are all trained on how to, um, how to fight fires. And so there on the left, you can see that they're in firefighting suits. They have gloves. The person at the top left has the reflective heavy firefighting suit. They all have uh, fire retardant uh, covers over their head. They're wearing gloves and um, they're manhandling a hose to put out a fire. And then on the right, um, that's the infamous tower. Uh, to be part of the submarine service, you enter the bottom of the tower and you um, do your best to get to the top of the tower. The tower is full of water. So you enter a chamber at the bottom and you learn how to escape from a submarine in that tower 
and uh, the change in pressure as you go up. If you don't exhale on the way up, your lungs will explode because of the difference in pressure. It's about 200 feet high. Um, so all the way up, you're in this mask, and you're ho, 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 all the way up. And you don't have to inhale because the, the air in your lungs is expanding, and you have to exhale all the way up to the top. So they teach you to be Santa Claus all the way up. How tall is the tower? 200 feet. Okay? <laughs> now, um, yeah, it, it's an experience, and... and um, that's a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing. Uh, I would not recommend putting that on your bucket list uh, of things to do. Uh, that one's in Hawaii, uh, and I believe that structure is still there. Uh, anyway, that's that's part of the submarine surf. Next slide. Sure. Um, yeah. On that tower, do you have to have any breathing apparatus at the bottom, or are you just inhale as much as you can? No, they, there's a mask. That, that you literally put over your head and they pressurize it with air. So that, yeah. This is a, <laughs> this was a flood control trainer. And they, they literally teach you how to patch pipes and to use the wrenches to tighten up flanges and do those kind of things. And it is a room uh, about this size and it's uh, two to three stories high. And there's a control room with a window with um, very st sadistic people at the control panel uh, <laughs> in there. And, and so what you see is a simulated engineering space. The panel to his right is actually you know, a simulated electric panel. And so we had to go through a flooding procedure. And so the people in the, uh, in the control room can flip a switch and cause different leaks to happen. And we had a pretty good crew that went in, and, and we were literally uh, taking care of leaks. This is a wrench, actually has a chain attached to it, and then there's lead sheets and rubber that you wrap around this pipe, you put the chain wrench around it, and then you slide the, the lead sheet and the um, rubber plastic around the pipe to stop the leak, uh, or to stop the flooding. Our group, uh, we got in there and um, we had pretty much knocked down all the flooding to, or the, the seawater leaks to a controlled um, measure. And we all kind of stood there for what felt like 10 seconds. I'm sure it was like a split second. We all looked at each other like, oh crap. And about that same time, they flipped the switch for the most horrendous major leak um, and the is coming. Uh, it's just part of the trainer. Um, the water's not warm. Um, and you're literally walking around on decks, so it gets slippery. It's very realistic, uh, except you know that it's not life and death. You know it's a training exercise. But the, the tools and the training that you have to go through to be able to do this uh, was put, uh, put to the test. And um, yeah, they, they let go with that flange, and we, um, it's very loud, you can't hear. It's, it's deafening the roar of the water that's there. And um, yeah, you, you learn how to survive in a very hostile environment. So. Uh, that's home. <laughs> um, that's your space. That's the only place you can go for any kind of privacy. Is that a hot bunk? Hot bunking, uh, the term comes from sharing a bunk with somebody else. Um, very early in my career, I had to do that for like three days. And hot bunking means that when you crawl in, it's still warm from the guy who got out. And it is not a good feeling. Um, yeah, it's kind of creepy. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was in the torpedo room uh, when we were doing this. This was on sea trials uh, when we did this. This pan right here lifts up, and then you have about that much space underneath where your whole life goes. Your all of your clothing, um, everything fits 
fits in that little space. Uh, some, some of them have lockers, like on the other side of the passageway here, that are about this tall, about that wide, about that deep. And um, if at that time, if you were a smoker, um, that's where all of your cartons of cigarettes went. Now, nowadays, um, there's literally no smoking on submarines. Um, they, they uh, depending on the captain, um, they, they will, they, they've eliminated smoking underway. Um, yes, there are systems to remove cigarette smoke and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and all those things in the air. Um, but that that was that was it. Now this is the um, space for a lot of practical jokes as well. Um, there was one night in I was laying in my bunk and I was reading a book, and um, at at the end of the bunk you can't see it here. There's an intake to a fan, and that that intake then goes all the way around and blows cold air over the top of your head and, and through the bunk. So the air is continuously circulating, even though the curtains are closed. Well, a friend of mine decided, and he could see in there enough that he could see I was reading a book, he took a bottle of baby powder <laughs> and squeezed it into the intake vent. And within a second, my breathing space was full of baby powder and I literally couldn't breathe and so I flung the curtain back and grabbed for his ankle which he got away and um, it, it took a few minutes to get all of the baby powder out of there but literally if you can think about it somebody's squeezing a baby powder thing over your head as you're laying down and it, it's going down out and across so uh, I thanked him profusely <laughs> for making my bunk smell better <coughs> and uh, pre preventing chafing between the sheets and the blanket and other things. But uh, um, yeah, you usually don't mess with somebody's private space, but uh, Eric was a, a different character and he and I, uh, he and I still talk today. So next. <coughs> um, you're looking into uh, what they call a Sherwood Forest, I believe, uh, on a missile submarine. Uh, through that hatch you can see missile tubes. And um, there you can see a firefighter suit hanging right here. And then this is a kick plate uh, so that you don't kick the pipes and some of the insulation that's around that. But that's a typical hatch, and then a watertight door swings the other way and comes in and seals up to a big rubber seal. Um, and yes, they're tile floors, and yes, they are in that shiny. And please ask any questions that you want to as we go through. Yes, sir? What was the crew count? 150. Now, on a, on a ballistic missile submarine, uh, it's manned with two crews. There's a blue crew and a gold crew. Each crew has 150 members, um, equally manned on both sides, uh, as far as uh, numbers go. Um, talent, we would always question whether the other crew had any smarts at all. But um, This was designed to keep the submarine at sea uh, as long as possible and, and as often as possible. So um, the whole crew would go out. Um, do a 80, 90 day patrol, come in, um, the blue crew would come on board, assume control of the submarine, we would help them refit the submarine, fix anything that was wrong, paint, correct, do things, and then the, the blue crew would take it to sea for 90 days and we would um, go to two or three day or two or three weeks off and then we would start training for, um, for the next patrol. Would you turn to base between deployments, or would you? Yeah, and the boat would always come back, well, Bangor, Washington. Yeah. That's where, or Kings Bay, Georgia. But the, the boat would always come back to the same place, and it would swap out crews, and, and off they would go. Yes, sir? Uh, what was the exterior of a submarine made of? 
Um, I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. <laughs> and the other thing, how deep did you go and what pressure were you at? Um, 44 pounds for every 100 feet of depth. So, so how deep did you go? <laughs> greater than 800 feet. And that, that's, uh, how, uh, I'm not supposed to okay. say. Okay. Great, great, greater than 20 <laughs> knots. pressure you're under. Great, greater than 20 knots, greater than 800 feet is the standard answer. Um, typical cruising, uh, 400, 200 to 400 feet, depending on what, what we were doing and, and what the sea state was. Yes, sir. You had another question? Did I answer your question? And, and without giving you specific numbers, did I answer your question? Okay. Um, yeah, so out, out the back of a submarine, was a uh, was a wire, and it did two things. One, it listened for anybody that was trying to trail us, and two, uh, it passively received messages, um, so that if um, in the unfortunate incident that we ever have to launch, but a a warning would come passively. Um, to say get to Periscope Duff to get a message and we would go get a message and, um, and if the message said prepare to launch missiles then that's what we would go do. That was a discussion a lot. Um, if we ever had to launch missiles would you want to go home? Knowing that military bases were usually targets for the other side. And it came to varying degrees of, of yes and no, whether or not we would want to go back home. Um, knowing that the submarine base that we came from was probably destroyed from the other side. So one of those, um, <clears throat> when you're at sea for 90 days, you can have a lot of good times and you can have some very sobering thoughts as well. And it, it's, uh, certainly is a different environment. Uh, but you're also left to your own devices for a lot of practical jokes. So, um, more on that in just a second. Yes, sir? In that regard, how long could you stay at sea? The submarine could stay at sea indefinitely. <coughs> we would run out of food before we ran out of anything else. Uh, we would pack for about 120 days of food. Uh, there was one instance when we came back on peanut butter and jelly and beanies and weenies. <laughs> um, USS Perchy, I think, has the record for 126 days straight at sea. And that was the second submarine that I served on. Uh, yeah. And, and so literally when you leave port, you are, as I would go from birthing to the engineering spaces, you would walk across layers of food, canned food. <coughs> and as the patrol went along, the cans would, would sink down. So, hey, we must be getting close to the end of patrol. I can see the tiles again. So, uh, next picture. Uh, diving, and this is more of a modern picture. We didn't have these fancy uniforms when we went when we went to sea. Um, we had one-piece jumpsuits, uh, otherwise known as poopy suits, and it, it had uh, our rank and insignia's name and then the submarine qualifications, but. That's the diving in planes uh, stations with the diving officer behind them, and they control the depth and the steerage of the, uh, of the submarine. Um, my youngest son got to do what they call the Tiger Cruise, and he spent um, about one full day uh, on the submarine, and I have a, he has uh, a picture of him uh, sitting there and uh, underway submerged, and he's got control of the submarine. Um, now that I think about what he's doing today, it kind of scares me. So, <laughs> he's, a, he's actually a third grade teacher. Good kid. Next picture. Wow. Uh, kind of an idea of a control room. <clears throat> Not a good picture. Next one. Um, this is, does this turn off the lights up here? Yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, ah, there we go. That's, that's better. That's sonar. Um, the screen that you see up here, these screens, um, the waves that are coming down, 
on the, on the monitors there are actually noises out in the ocean. And the thicker, um, the, the noises that kind of line up are, are actually uh, ships uh, or other targets, <laughs> um, other vessels that are out there. And these guys are so good, um, you know, there's contact at tens of thousands of yards, blade rate. They can tell you how fast the propeller is spinning. They can tell you what direction they're going. They can tell you how fast they're going. And they can tell you that it's a freighter. Or they can tell you that it's a submerged um, object. Or they can tell you whatever. Um, I, I just, the, the, the training that these guys get. We call them sonar girls. No offense. <laughs> Please. Um, because of all the electronics in that room, um, the temperature in that room was about 42 degrees. Wow. Um, and so they were wearing winter fall weather jackets yeah. in there just to stay on their watch. And um, so we, sorry, <laughs> we, we kind of made fun of them. Uh, I, I will tell you one night uh, I could not sleep and I had a, the chief in there was a very good friend of mine. And so I kind of peeked my head in and what are you doing up? I said, man, I can't sleep. And he said, sit down. Handed me, a head of set, or handed me a set of headphones. And for the next half hour, I listened to whales talk. Now, you want to talk about something that will relax you and put you to sleep? Uh, I almost fell asleep in the chair. It, it was just... Um, anyway, it was just um, so relaxing to hear that and I um, whatever it was that was keeping me awake just got me totally relaxed and so they the, the sonar guys are good for something but um, careful now <laughs> well they use up a lot of fresh water because they shower like twice a day and three times and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, on a bad day it was three times, in case they ever sweat in their fall weather jackets kind of thing. Um, but they, they were also the first, they shut down their gear right away, so as soon as the brow went over, they were gone. Back in engineering spaces, we were hours away from shutting down the engineering spaces, so the sonar guys were on the beach while we were still working. They were the last ones to show up because they don't fire up their gear until they're so we're out. So I know what is it in the Navy? Choose choose your rate, choose your fate, and uh, uh, I decided to be a, a nuclear engineer. Go ahead. Uh, food. Uh, they serve four meals a day, twelve and six, um, because you are on watch. Uh, uh, yeah, the the watch relief happened that at uh, 6, 12, 6, and 12. <coughs> and you, uh, so they served meals. And you could tell what time of day it was by what the meal was. Um, if it was beanies and weenies, and, and uh, it was mid-rats, it was midnight. Um, if it was hamburgers, it was noon. That's the difference between the 12s. Um, when, we, when we went to sea, um, as soon as we threw the lines off and started down, the uh, control room would announce uh, switch all clocks to Zulu time. So it could be 8 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden it would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon, just by resetting the clocks. So we had to be on the same time as um, strategic <coughs> commands around the world, and we call that Zulu time. And so we. Um, you, you went to see the first day you were messed up anyway, and then your clock's all messed up, and it, it took a couple of days to get, to get acclimated about what you were doing. On top of that, you were literally working an 18-hour day. If, um, let's say at 6 o'clock in the morning, you did six hours of watch. From noon to 6, you would have to do maintenance, um, training, learn how to whatever your next watch station was and then from let's see, 6 to 12, 12 to 6, 6 to midnight um, you could sleep 
and then you're back on watch at midnight to six. Um, and so sometimes you still watch twice on the same calendar day. And that's the the only time the only way you knew really what time it was was by the logs that you were taking and 24 hours worth of readings that we would have to take throughout the submarine, especially in the engineering spaces. So it literally was an 18 hour day. Uh, for those of us who were four section, uh, you stood one six hour watch in a 24 hour period and then you did other things that you had to do. So the more senior you were, the more um, likely you were to be in that four section rotation. So they had to serve a meal um, four times a day. And that's what chow line looks like. Um, it looks, <coughs> I don't know what they're serving there, it almost looks like uh, Mexican night. Um, yeah, next slide. Oh, did I tell you how much fun it is to come back home? <laughs> um, that's actually the statue. Um, uh, from World it's War one II. of the things that we're going to do. That's from World War II. Actually, it was Times Square when that picture was taken. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's a reputation that sailors have. And, uh, yeah. Next. Um, that's what we call a sound mount. Um, Admiral Rickover, who was the father of nuclear power in the Navy, said that when an when Ohio-class submarine went to sea, um, what they would hear, the best way to find an Ohio-class submarine was to look for a hole in the water where there was no noise. Because the submarine was going to be quieter than the environment around it. And uh, true to form, he was um, pretty correct. Uh, it's very difficult to track and trail uh, an Ohio-class submarine. What it is, this, this piece here and the pieces that are mounted around it um, are sound mounted so that any engineering noises um, are sound isolated from the hull. There's no metal-to-metal -metal contact between any engineering piece, anything that can make noise, a pump, a, a turbine, or anything. Um, it was mounted so that that rubber piece, this is rubber, um, would absorb all the noise before it could radiate to the hull. And, and therefore it was very, very quiet. And uh, next. Oh yeah, we, we occasionally have fun. Um, it's called swim call. What you don't see is a guy at the top of the sail, uh, the long tower <coughs> who has a rifle. <laughs> And the purpose of the rifle is um, for sharks, uh, depending on you were, where you were and, and doing that. Um, you, uh, you could do swim call, but um, just for the safety of the crew, um, there would be somebody up there with a rifle, just in case uh, it sounded like the meal ticket had rang for the, uh, for the top of the food chain in the ocean. <laughs> Next. Um, that's the top of the sail. Um, it gives you an idea of ballast tanks. Um, and and this, is, this is the design. Um, what makes a submarine float is that there, um, there's the people tank. And there's the hard core metal, um, what we call the, the people tank. On the outside of that, like the double hull, is um, huge voids that we can fill with air and it makes the submarine very buoyant um, and then at the top of those tanks were, were um, valves that you could open that would allow water to come in the bottom of the tank let the air escape out the top and that would make the submarine submerge or allow the, the submarine to submerge um, capabilities of periscopes oh the, the helicopter uh, I was on the party. We were off the coast of San Diego, and we were playing games with um, some surface ships. And they um, and, and you can communicate to submerged be, uh, uh, vessels. And they uh, basically said, "You are here," and we said, "No, we're not." And well, we can hear you. You're here, and we said, "No, we're not. We're not there." 
And uh, so prove it. And so we um, surfaced the submarine. <coughs> Nowhere near where they thought we were. So they, in playing the games, they lifted, it was a, a aircraft carrier, but it was a helo carrier. So a helicopter lifted off, and they were dropping sonar boys, sonar boys <coughs> all over the place. And they said, well, we know you're here. And then when we surfaced, the guys in the helicopter, it was hilarious. They, they thought they had scared us to the surface. So they have the door open to the helicopter, and they're pointing, and you can see cameras and pictures going off. They thought they had won the war. <laughs> and then we submerged again, and they said, okay, you're here. And we said, no, we're not, and how can we prove it to you? Uh, next slide. Um, so we did one of those. <laughs> and oh, nice. and um, see, we're not there. And, and what you see there, and, and this is um, the hunt for Red October. Mm -hmm. You saw an actual submarine do what they call an emergency blow. And so you ring up a head standard, um, which gives a, a good forward momentum to the submarine. And then you uh, literally throw two levers in the control room, and that puts 3,000 pound air into those ballast tanks. Now the valves on the top are shut, so the water is being forced out the bottom of those ballast tanks. Those ballast tanks fill with air, and it makes the submarine super buoyant. Super buoyant. And then you put a 27 degree angle up on the submarine. So the submarine's coming up at that angle. Its ballast tanks are full of air, and you had a head standard bell on it at the same time. And that's the result. The, the submarine literally comes up out of the water uh, to do that. And um, I've done that from greater than 800 feet, and that is a ride. Um, for those of you who remember the e-ticket rides at Disneyland, this is better than an e-ticket ride. Um, it, it is, um, oh, the submarine vibrates, um, and, and you can hear the air rushing uh, through that, and then the submarine, your whole world, um, takes a 27 degree angle. So you're literally standing like this, and, and um, it's, yes sir? How long did that take? About a minute. Depends on how deep you are. Right. Um, from greater than 800 feet, it seemed like forever. Um, and one of the most dangerous things that can happen when you get on the surface, because now you have no emergency air, uh, if the submarine was to start sliding backwards, um, like if we lost propulsion, that's not a good thing. Because uh, all the, it, it, depending on the angle, it, if it starts sliding backwards, you could begin spilling the air out of the tanks, uh, and, and um, bad things happen after that. Yes, sir? What would be the purpose for doing that? Um, torpedo evasion, flooding in <coughs> engineering spaces. Um, we had to do it once a, uh, at least twice a year to prove that the submarine could do it. Um, yeah, mostly for flooding, um, to get that thing on the surface to protect the crew. Yeah, it's a fun ride. Um, here you can see uh, out the bottom that water is still being forced out of the forward ballast tanks. Um, it, it's it's kind of cool. <laughs> um, next. Yeah, that, that's just a... Um, if you're not a submarine, you're a target. Next. <laughs> so... Uh, <clears throat> Jerry, you have orders to the USS, SSBN 728, USS No Name. And I said, uh, what's, what's No Nami? <laughs> what's USS No, no, no Nami? Uh, report to Groton and Electric Boat Naval <coughs> Shipyard. And so I got there, and uh, that's a poor picture. Uh, but in essence, uh, that was, uh, it was USS No Name because they couldn't decide what the third Trident what state it was going to be named after. So uh, it was USS No Name, then it was going to be the Iowa. 
Uh, and then they brought the Iowa back out of mothballs, the old battleship. And then they said, uh, well, let's see, the following one's going to be the Georgia. And they said, okay, you are now the USS Florida. And uh, it was about you know, six to eight months um, before I knew the name of the first submarine I was going to serve on. But um, <clears throat> pretty much, next slide, um, that was kind of what I walked into. Um, here you see um, the submarine is actually inside a building, and they're taking, this thing's 560 feet long. That's the sonar dome um, that will be covered by the cone. Um, but they literally, the submarine was in sections, and so my first time seeing it, they were actually sliding the engineering spaces and all of its platforms uh, into the hull and then sound mounting it uh, as we went through. And, um, and then as part of the crew, we did all the testing to make sure it was, it was there. Um, that's what one of those things looks like in dry dock. It's actually sitting on huge um, wooden blocks. Um, and, and they're designed to literally hold the submarine in place um, while it's there. Interesting story. Um, the Loma Prieto uh, earthquake, um, World Series earthquake. Everybody remember when the Giants in Oakland were playing? Mm -hmm. And Al Michaels, was it Al Michaels? Got interrupted before the game even started because of the, uh, of the earthquake. Um, I was on the Parchy, I was in the engine room upper level, and um, the submarine, we're in dry dock, we're sitting on wooden blocks, and the submarine starts doing this. Oh. Oh. And I'm like, and, and then it starts jumping, and then the submarine just kind of did one of these, it, it kind of lifted and rolled, and then you could feel it settle back into the blocks. Mm. And then it lifted oh. again, and settled back into the blocks, and I thought, what? <laughs> what is going on? Well, what I had thought, this is obviously a, a crane that, that was swinging at the time of the picture. I had thought a crane had fallen over and hit the submarine. And uh, so I went up the escape trunk in the engineering spaces. And um, about that time, the control room announced uh, that we were experiencing an earthquake. So um, the submarine's here. The Napa River is here, held back by a caisson. And then there was a barge where all of our offices were while the submarine was being worked on. So I climbed up the escape trunk, and I'm looking at the caisson to see if we're about to flood a submarine, because we had holes in the hull. And the guys on the barge were looking at the submarine to see if it was really good with 33 feet of Napa River, um, literally behind them, about as far from me as this wall. <coughs> you guys are looking in the wrong place. But. Uh, Went home, probably about an hour and a half later, our shift was over and um, saw what had happened uh, down in San Francisco. Some of the old buildings at Merrill and Naval Shipyard uh, had crumbled and bricks were laying on the streets as I walked uh, through the shipyard to go home. But next picture. Somebody asked the hull. That's a titanium hull piece. It's about three inches thick. That's the hull of the side. <laughs> Yeah. Next. Um, kind of what it looked like when they were rolling. There you can see the cone uh, over the sonar dome. Um, they were, um, this thing is literally on miniature rail cars and it's being um, moved out of the assembly building. And then it, once it's out, then it would go sideways and then a um, platform would sink and put it into dry dock. So, um, yeah. That, that was my first submarine. I, I, uh, what have I got myself into? Next. There's a daylight picture. Next. It's getting redundant. I should not put this on. Go ahead, Ed. Um, submarine dolphins are um, very, very uh, special to submarines. You are required to earn, it's called a warfare pin, and that's the submarine warfare pin. Um, 
nicknamed dolphins. You had to earn your dolphins. Um, to do so, you had to uh, go through uh, a very long qualification card. You had to learn about every system on board that submarine. Um, and then you had to sit down at an oral board and prove that you knew enough about the submarine that you could do damage control anywhere on the submarine. Now, I didn't have to know how to operate the sonar systems like the sonar uh, guys did, but uh, I had to know what it did, how it functioned, where it was powered from, those kinds of things. It's the equivalent <coughs> of, and so what you see there, and I can't see the ear, um, the, the wiring diagram that you see there is for a Corvette. And um, you, you either, depending on who you were, you either had to be able to draw it or explain it. And in explaining it, like there's different switches and controls. I know it's a poor drawing, but there's different switches and controls. You needed to know what caused the switch to turn off and what numerical value that was for it to turn off. So um, it, it literally is um, whatever car you drive, you would be able to describe each and every system in that car and understand how it works and the parameters by which caused alarm lights on your dash to come on. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that, that's, the, that's the intensity of learning what a submarine is and what it does. So when I tell you that you have six hours of watch, six hours of maintenance and study, and six hours of sleep, that six hours of maintenance and study was learning all about the submarine or learning about what it was your specific job was on that submarine. Okay? So it, it is intense. My oral board lasted about three and a half hours. And, uh, um, oh, I'm so glad it was over. <laughs> but I, I had two lookups. I had to go, um, two things I had to go find out about after three hours of grilling. And, and I learned then um, that was not the last board I would sit in front of. Jerry, yeah. how many board members and who's on the board? Three, uh, and it varies. Three or four. It varies, but none of them could be the same rate or specialty. Uh, mine was uh, a senior chief auxiliaryman, and, and they know more about the submarine than anybody else. Uh, a sonarman. Wow, I can't remember the third name. That was only like 38 years ago, so I'm, I'm good with the first two. Um, but the dolphins, uh, that is such a, um, such a pin to wear with pride uh, because of what you have to go through to earn them. So, next. Um, everybody wants to know how a nuclear power plant operates. Okay, maybe you didn't want to. <laughs> uh, this is the reactor, um, and, and it has a pump that circulates water through the reactor and it does that continually. This is a steam generator. This water never touches the steam water. Okay, there's a barrier about that thick in some <coughs> tubes, but um, th these waters never intermingle. <coughs> so if you hear about uh, well, the, the steam plant had a reactor leak, and I hear this on movies. We'll talk about movies a little bit, and, and I laugh because it, it's so technically wrong. But, um, so this very hot water, uh, and this is a pressurizer, so this is at uh, several hundred pounds of pressure uh, and very hot, uh, 400 plus degrees kind of thing. So as that water circulates through the steam generator, the feed water, the fresh water over here, becomes steam. <coughs> the steam turns turbines, which makes electricity. The steam turns turbines, which makes uh, gears turn and makes the propeller go, <laughs> makes the water go through, makes the boat go through the water. Uh, the steam also boils seawater to make fresh water. Um, on the Trident missile submarine, we could make 12,000 gallons a day of fresh water. 
it would operate mm, 16 to 18 hours out of the day. Um, and then we had an emergency <coughs> uh, fresh water maker that made about 3,000 uh, gallons a day. Yeah? Did you, did you have backup propulsion? We did. Um, there's an emergency propulsion motor, which was a, a motor, uh, electrically driven. It was a DC motor, so we didn't have to have AC power to, to run it. And then we had uh, SPMs, which is nothing better than a, a 12 horsepower Um <laughs> <laughs> That could get us to stand still in a good current. Uh, was not going to get us home, but um, it, it could get us home. Uh, the diesel generator would supply power enough for that um, secondary propulsion motor to get us someplace. Yeah. Is there any auxiliary cooling for the reactor of water? Auxiliary cooling? In other words, it's hot all the time? Uh, no. Uh, when we pull into port, we would cool it down. How? Uh, bleed steam. Okay. So there's no uh, external cooling device for it? There is. It was called emergency cooling. Okay. Uh, so if we had a reactor accident, uh, we had a, an emergency means of removing heat from that thing. We were not going to do a China syndrome. Um, yeah. What what would make that uh, noiseless for other submarines? Yeah, you would think. Um, well, one, um, it's just that sound mounting. Um, if this, if there's a pump sitting on this platform. So the, the, this platform is going to feel and sense all the vibration. Vibration is noise. Um, now you put a piece of rubber here, and you, you put it on there. It, it uh, attenuates the sound. If, if this is the hull, mm -hmm. then the, tran the noise transmitted from this pump to this platform is insulated by this piece of rubber. It's not going to be transmitted to the hull. We, we weren't stone deaf quiet, OK? Um, but we didn't make a whole lot of noise. Um, I, I can tell you um, we were off the coast of Florida doing sound trials and we heard a, a Kula class Russian submarine leaving Cuba and heading home and uh, it sounded like uh, somebody with a, a shovel banging against a trash can. It was that loud. <laughs> Wow. And, and uh, I, I mean, they didn't care how much noise they were making, they were just going. Yeah, Joe? Is that salt water or fresh water? Fresh water. E each of these is fresh water. Very fresh water. And it's gone through a deionizing um, system. So it, it is, it's about as pure as you can get. Because we, we make fresh water from salt water. Um, and then it separates the, the, the two. There's potable water that we would consume. We didn't really care if there was anything in it, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, but then there was fresh water for the steam plant and the reactor plant, and that water had to be very, very clean uh, to, to the point where you couldn't hardly detect anything in it. I don't, I don't remember what the specs were, but uh, yeah. Well, yeah. What would be, uh, how many years would it be uh, that they actually tore that down, you know, to check it out or maintain yeah. it or whatever? Um, the, 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 um, the reactor would be refueled about every 20 to 25 years. So they would actually pull the core out and put a new one in, and then they would take the old one back and dissect it. Huh. One thing that, that's common knowledge as well, you, you had asked about the, the, the noise. If you turn these pumps off, there, are, there is no noise. Well, they developed a reactor plant system that required no pumps. It was natural circulation. Uh, you know how hot air rises and cold air sinks? Um, in, a, in an engineering sort of way, the, the hot water would rise to a point where steam was made, and the colder water would sink back to the reactor. And, um, and then heat up and then it would just naturally circulate. Well, if you don't have to run the pumps, you are much more quiet. Yeah. Um, 
engineering spaces were kind of noisy, typically about 90 degrees back there, because uh, of all the steam plant piping. <coughs> Lots of air conditioning for the submarine. Um, I was not good at wearing hearing protection when I first went out. So a little bit of a hearing loss. Uh, my wife would tell you I have a lot of bit of her hearing loss. <laughs> uh, especially in the frequency at which she speaks. Um, and uh, that, that's how I tell that story. So, <laughs> next. Uh, yeah, that's a Drayton is a little submarine. Uh, underway. Next. A um, little bit. Did I tell you how much fun it is to come home? Uh, okay, I, I just want to make sure I covered that. Um, top of a trident, it's a tugboat pushing it to getting it ready uh, to go. This was my job the last couple of times out, um, being up there to handle lines and, and uh, make sure top side was rigged for, uh, for going to sea or coming home. Uh, and then a little bit up there, uh, you, you never really get a good picture of what um, what the engineering spaces look like. It's very confidential. Um, you'll very seldom see any pictures. Uh, I, I tried to look for submarine engineering pictures, and I found none. In fact, what I found was the diagram that's on the top of the slide there, uh, which gives you a little bit about what that is. Go ahead, Ed. Um, that is one picture that I uh, that I did find. That's what they call the maneuvering room. Um, an officer or an engineering watch supervisor, a senior enlisted person, would sit in that room and have overall control. Um, this is where the throttle person stood. This is reactor plant control, and this is electric plant control. And uh, from there, um, we ran, literally ran the engineering spaces. <coughs> Throttles, the big wheel is the ahead turbines, the little wheel is the astern. The reactor plant control panel controlled the actual reactor, and then the electric plant was where um, an operator stood that maintained control of uh, the major portions of the electric power plant uh, on the submarine. That's, uh, that's a maneuvering room. It, it sat on the upper level and the forward most part of the engineering spaces, and then everything else um, was behind it. Next. Yeah, so uh, the USS Florida, when we went to sea, um, we got to fire one of these things uh, off the coast of Florida. Uh, it was not uh, armed. Um, that's a nuclear ballistic missile. Uh, it landed on an island off the coast of Africa. Uh, and it was a successful fire of a Trident missile submarine. Um, Submarine instantaneously lost nine feet in depth when the missile shot. And they had uh, tracking control over the uh, announcing system on the submarine. So we were sitting there and it sounded like NASA control. Um, missiles so far downrange, speed, and, and so on. So it sounded like a launch that you would normally hear coming out of, uh, out of the cave. Um, they showed us a video. Uh, the, the missile is literally blown to the surface with air. So as the missile goes up to the surface, it is in a bubble. It is surrounded by air, so the missile's not getting wet. And, and it, it's enough that the missile, and this thing weighs a lot, but the, the missile actually is in the air without its engines firing. And just about the time you see the, the missile begin to hesitate, maybe even slide backwards, the, the rocket engines take off. And it is gone. And, uh, yes. So it, it's uh, it's pretty cool. You can barely see some of the water still kind of around it. This is right after it's, it, it, it has a <coughs> next picture. Um, they don't always work. Whoops. <laughs> 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 That was not ours. So. <laughs> Sorry, Gina. Uh, next. <laughs> hey, Jerry. Yeah. What's the, what's the maximum depth that you can fire one of those from? You know, I don't know. We we were we were not very deep when we fired those. Things. Oh, okay. Uh, 100, 200 feet. Okay. So, yeah. From a, a standard duty crew state. 
What was your time to fire? Minutes. Minutes. Um, my, my first battle station was a phone talker and miss missile control. And here's this engineering dude um, on, the, on the headsets and phones. <coughs> Um, I literally had no job. I, I would sit in a chair and get out of the way of all the missile techs doing their job. <laughs> but I sat there and watched the weapons officer um, and uh, how they, how they uh, electronically fired up all the missiles. Called spinning the missiles up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it was, <laughs> this is cool. Wait. <laughs> This would mean a lot of bad things. So it was, um, yeah. Uh, if, if the if the gong went off, if if it was called battle stations missile, um, this is the captain. This is an exercise. Uh, was always what we wanted to hear after that. Um, the one time we fired, this is the captain. This is not an exercise. Which kind of gives you chills. Uh, but it, we all knew it was a test missile and we all knew it was coming. Um, the submarine, within a minute, would be at battle stations, all the people where they needed to be. And then the command would come down, spin up tubes, whatever. And um, with, within minutes, um, a missile could be off the ship, off the, off the boat. Um, we would have a heads up it was coming. Um, if a, remember that wire that we trailed behind? Um, we would get a signal that would cause a bell to go off, which let somebody know that emergency traffic was coming in. And um, then you would hear alert one, alert one. And that would let us know that there was a message coming in. And uh, that kind of gave you like, mm, you may be going to battle stations. Sometimes we did, sometimes we did not. Um, and off we go. That um, is a picture of a facility about 40 miles outside Idaho Falls, Idaho. Um, I was an instructor there, hence the education background again. Um, at actually three nuclear power plants at this facility and we would teach um, junior nuclear operators how to operate an actual nuclear power plant out in the middle of the desert. And, uh, hence the mountains and the flat ground. And, um, on the way from Bangor, Washington to Idaho Falls, Idaho, we left Boise, uh, came down through in Boise and we're going across southern Idaho. Anybody ever taken that uh, interstate? Yeah, so you know that it's uh, miles and miles of rolling um, sagebrush. <laughs> and uh, we're about halfway across, and um, my co-pilot uh, looks at me and goes, where, where are you taking us? And I said, it's only three and a half years on, we can do this standing on our heads. And uh, um, it turned out that it was uh, our most favorite duty station in a 20-year career, because Yellowstone Park was two hours away. And the Tetons were an hour away, and um, we just really enjoyed um, the Rocky Mountains. And uh, Idaho Falls was a, a, is a wonderful community. So, um, but each, each day we would go out there and take a bus out. You could drive out, um, but most of the time I took a bus. And, uh, what you're seeing there is steam. Uh, from cooling towers, so the heat and all the engineering things that would normally go out into the ocean were sent to a cooling tower and the heat was dissipated. So, next. That's the S5G prototype. It actually floated. Um, when I got there, they didn't do that anymore, but um, it, it was designed to test out a few things and that was the actual prototype that I worked on. So, next. Um, yeah. Chief's initiation. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yep. It, it's kind of like that. Tribal warfare. Um, Chief's initiation um, has changed a lot since then. Now, now it's a more um, 
civil, uh, humane way of initiating people uh, uh, to a new rank in the Navy. The Navy was very um, different in from E1 to E6 was, uh, was um, one part of the enlisted community. E7, 8, and 9 were um, different. And they separated those three NCOs, if you will, out from, literally from the rest of the Navy. And uh, when I made chief, there was such an initiation process that, um, uh, anybody know what a balut is? I knew a squid wouldn't raise his hand, uh, a balut. Uh, it's a duckling still in the egg. Duckling still in the egg. So, yeah. Use your imagination. Yeah. Next slide. <laughs> um, I had to eat several of those. Uh, I also had to drink a lot of truth serum, which was Tabasco sauce, tomato juice, cottage cheese, corn, cream corn. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. What's the problem? Yeah. <laughs> I had to stand in front of a judge. Uh, and plead my case. He asked if my lawyer had a license to practice, and he said it was a license off his motorcycle, <laughs> <laughs> which got me into more trouble. I ended up with like three or four hundred dollars in fines, and, and uh, uh, which I had to pay, which was interesting. But, um, yeah, that was cheap. You bought the cheap. beer. Um, little to no alcohol involved uh, until afterwards. <laughs> Um, for good reason. Um, that, folks, is the USS Perchy. Uh, has since been decommissioned, and you're, you might be shaving with it right now. Um, when, when I first reported aboard, this, this section was not uh, installed on the submarine. And, um, yeah, what's the next slide? Uh, no, go back to the other. Yeah. Uh, Parchi was what they called an a, a ocean engineering submarine, um, a spook boat. Um, this book, Blind Man's Bluff, uh, it's the untold story of American uh, submarine espionage. Um, I will tell you what the book says, because I have signed many pieces of paper that says I will never disclose what I knew, but this is a published book. Uh, a member of um, CIA was fishing out in Chesapeake Bay, and when they came back in, you've seen signs that says no Anchorage cable crossing. Uh, whenever you're out on the water, uh, even Lake Michigan and a few others have those, but basically it's a sign posted on either side of a waterway that says no Anchorage uh, cable crossing, which means there's a cable that goes under the water from one side of the canal to the other. And he said, well, I wonder if the Russians have those. And um, so uh, they went to go find out. Sure enough, they found in Russian uh, no, no Anchorage cable crossing. And then they looked to what was on either side of the cable. And what they found was a military installation and a military installation. And they said, wow, man, wonder what we could learn if we tapped into that cable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did, and um, some submarines were designed uh, to be able to go facilitate that. And I don't know what all we found out, but who won the Cold War? <laughs> we did. I believe we did. Um, so this book describes uh, a couple of different submarines that were outfitted and some of the bad things that happened. Uh, while they were doing that, and the book says um, about recording devices that we would tap into the cable and then leave the recording devices there, go home and come back and pick them up kind of thing. And one time they went back and the recording device was gone. Um, oh. um, so, um, yeah. Well, while I was there, they cut the perfectly good submarine um, and added a section. Uh, 
I'll let you all figure out what was part of what went into that section. Uh, but that's the that's the USS Parchy. Probably the most awesome platform I served on. Ballistic missile submarines were cool, but they were kind of generic for a submariner. Uh, these, this was these. This was the only one. Um, this was very special. Uh, next picture. Um, and so um, everybody knows about the Army Navy game. <laughs> and for 14 years, uh, we know who won. Uh, 14 years in a row. Now the last two have been won by the lesser of the two services. <laughs> but, uh, 14 years prior to that, we know who uh, who won the Army and Navy game. And uh, had it cheated. Well, I won't say there wasn't a little luck involved. <laughs> but after 14 years, I started cheering for Army um, just so that uh, my friends wouldn't hate me. So um, our captain was a graduate of Annapolis. Uh, this is a picture of the USS Parchy going by. Uh, oh shoot! Uh, the Army base uh, in San Francisco, um, Presidio. Uh, Presidio. Presidio. So uh, we were blowing the ship's whistle uh, at that time, and uh, as we uh, we had as many people on deck as we could, and we were waving at Presidio, and uh, they were waving back in one way, <laughs> shape, or form. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we flew our, our we flew our flag. Yeah. And, uh, so you can see the San Francisco uh, skyline in the, in the yeah. background. So. Next. How am I doing on time? We're, we're fine. Okay. Uh, Delta Pier in Bangor, Washington. Um, that would service uh, two Trident submarines uh, along this side and the top side. And then this is dry dock, and you can actually see a, a submarine sitting in the dry dock. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's Bangor, Washington. Mm -hmm. How far is that from where they bring in ships, you know, for be worked on? I mean, because I know Banger, I've been there and I've seen where the ships come in, you know, and where I never knew where they set. What okay, um, this is on in uh, Hood Canal. Yeah. So the Straits of Juan de Fuca, that, uh, the, the Straits on uh, the north side of uh, the Olympic Peninsula, between us and Canada. Yeah. Um, would come in. Seattle would be straight ahead, or Everett, because there's a carrier base there. Hood Canal would come down south, and that's where the Bangor subbase was. Basically, Silverdale, Washington. I get to go there. Okay. Okay. Next. <laughs> uh, next. <laughs> Must have been Mexican night. <laughs> um, Arnold. <laughs> See, that, that was a surface ship. I could not resist putting that in there. Okay, practical jokes. Um, enlisted people had loved, loved to play practical jokes on officers. Um, little did this uh, Lieutenant JG know that the eyepieces were coated with black shoe polish. Okay? So when he stood back, um, he looked like a raccoon. <laughs> Couldn't see it right away until everybody in the patrol room kind of uh, snickered at him. Uh, that's the emblem for Master Chief Petty Austin. Um, uh, 17 years, um, I was uh, awarded that rank. And, and that's uh, as far in the Navy as one could go. There was one higher, but that would be called Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. And I, again, I did not serve at the Pentagon, nor did I ever want to go to the Pentagon, and, and so that was not a, uh, an option. Um, it, it was described to me once, um, submariners are um, uh, like the top 10% uh, uh, of the Navy because of the um, qualifications we had to go through in order to earn the dolphins and, and knowing the systems and so on. And then uh, Master Chiefs were the top uh, 1 to 2 percent of that. So um, it, I felt very honored uh, to be able to get that. The, the story behind that is really kind of funny. Um, you can call in, when the results are out, you can call in on a line. And two of my mentors had, uh, 
had passed away. Two Master Chief Petty Officers that uh, uh, very good, very good people, very strong and, and powerful Master Chiefs. And, uh, that's a background to a, a fun walk I had. But, uh, the results came out, and I called the whatever number out of online, and, and it said, uh, "Better luck next year." Basically, and you did not make Master Chief. Bummer. So I sat there, and for some reason, um, call that number again. So I did. Congratulations, you made Master Chief. Mm -hmm. Right. Which one do I believe? <laughs> so uh, it was uh, it was a day off, and I had come in just to see what the results were. So I decided to walk down to the Delta Pier, which I just showed you a picture of. Whatever, whatever your beliefs are, whatever. But I immediately began to think about these two Master Chiefs, Master Chief Gillespie and Master Chief Beauty. And uh, I swear. On the way walking down to Delta Pier, I could hear them laughing. Mm -hmm. I mean, just howling. <laughs> and I, I, and I, like I said, I was just thinking about them. I said, you two guys are messing with me big time. And I got down there, and uh, there were some celebrations going on. And the master chief of the repair facility <clears throat> I had worked for on the Florida a long time ago. He says, well, did you make it? I said, I don't know. I called twice. I got a, yes, a no and a yes. And so one of the, the other guys said, give me your number. And so he called. And we called the command career, the group career, career counselor, who I also knew. And uh, he said, uh, Joe, the other master chief, said, I'm sitting in my office. Chester's sitting here wondering if he made master chief. And he goes, well, I don't, I don't, I don't have that list. Oh. Well, crap, yes, you do, you know, kind of thing. And they were teasing me. This guy that I gave the number to came in. He goes, okay, you made Master Chief. And I said, that's two out of three. I still have doubt in my name. You know? <laughs> um, so Ed, at the other end of the phone, starts reading my social security number. Well, the only way he could have known that is to have the list and have me on it. So uh, that's how I found out that I made Master Chief. And uh, to this day, I think about those two Master Chief mentors. Go ahead. Um, top left, uh, Jack Bucci had his ashes uh, buried at sea. Uh, top right is um, when you cross the Arctic Circle, when you cross the equator, when you cross the International Date Line, or any other reason to have fun on a submarine. <laughs> up and we do silly things and so on. And lower left you can see a reef being put in the water. Uh, bottom right, um, submarines do get lost at sea. Um, I can tell you that uh, two nuclear power plants are sitting at the bottom of the ocean, USS Tullaby and USS Scorpion. Uh, and then uh, several from World War II. So, uh, next picture. Question. Yes, sir. What can you tell me about the Scorpion? I mean, my wife's cousin was on that. There's, there's rumors. Um, Tullaby went down. Um, she rumors was, rumors were that she had a reactor accident, and um, or something that went wrong. And, and part of that casualty procedure was to secure all steam to the engine room. So when, who asked the question? Yeah. Thank you. Um, part of the casualty procedure was to secure all steam to the engine room while that killed propulsion. Uh, so that procedure got changed immediately, but she went down um, for whatever reason. And, uh, the Scorpion, there are so many rumors uh, around the Scorpion. So. Uh, I don't know which rumor is true, and, and we never really got briefed on what people with much more clearances than I have know back in Washington. But the, the thought was um, she was playing chicken with a Russian submarine, and um, 
either had a battery explosion or they exchanged torpedoes. And um, I've never seen anything that would confirm or deny either, either story. No, the, the, that, uh, the Navy <coughs> Department took a long, long time before they let the parents know that the submarine was on his way back home, but I got shipped out for a special mission. And it was like months later, and, then, and nobody knew anything. Yeah. Years later. The Tullaby was uh, a little easier. She was on the sea trials. And, um, yeah, the, the Scorpion, and, and I've read the, the same stories, and, and I thought that was a very poor way of handling um, a missing submarine. Mm -hmm. um, women have a, an intuition that I will never argue with. And um, Carol knows when things aren't going right, you know, kind of thing, even when I'm at sea, kind of thing. So uh, families find out, and then there's suspicions, and it just makes things worse. And I think today um, things are handled much differently. <clears throat> when a serviceman passes away or if a submarine was to go missing. Was the Scorpion a nuclear sub? Oh. Um, this a uh, Trident missile submarine pulling in the banger? Missile control, top left, and the uh, big picture on the right. Um, that's the control station by which um, missiles are spun up and ready. There's this. Um, no, we're not normally dressed in choker whites to steer the ship or do anything, but this is a trigger mechanism that launches missiles. So you can see the cord, and the red trigger is the missile way. Um, so that's the missile house, or missile control center. Next. That's a hatch going open, or one that's already open and one going open. Uh, the track here is for windward topside. Um, we can actually hook into that track and walk up and down, and um, if we happen to slip, we don't go overboard. Um, so those, those are important as well. Next. Um, yeah. Part, part of the fun, this is a Trident, uh, 24 missile subs. This is a <coughs> earlier version of a ballistic missile submarine. But you can see inside the, the hatches there, um, they're painted up like uh, pool balls. <laughs> Stripes and solids, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. uh, full rack. Yeah. Full, full rack, there you go. Sitting in port, um, they're on occasion uh, for all of the strategic um, treaties that went on uh, occasionally just even sitting in dry dock we had to open up a hatch uh, to show passing satellites part of the treaties wow. next ah, that is uh, what they call a degaussing um, station it removes any magnetic signature that the submarine might have and uh, it's, it, demagnetizes the submarine. So the cables are actually 360 degrees around the sub. There's some under the water. Uh, but kind of a cool <coughs> Next. Yep. Very cool. We go through the ice. Uh, the sail is reinforced to, uh, to crash through several feet of ice. I don't know what the markings are out there. It must be the crew was out playing or something. But, uh, next. That's actually the, the sail is up there. This is actually the rudder uh, sticking up to the ice. Next. And visitors. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they were thinking. Dinner. What is this big seal? Uh, <laughs> big seal. Call in reinforcements. <laughs> yeah. uh, next. Nothing better. <laughs> Next. And 
yes, uh, sometimes children were born while we're up. Mm -hmm. uh, an engineer um, got a, a message that his wife had given birth to a baby. Not this particular picture, but... Uh, What's the rate insignia? Machinist made. That's what I was. Okay. Um, the propeller there is, uh, has been uh, a machinist made emblem in the Navy from prior to World War II. That was my dream. There you can see the submarine dolphins above his ribbons. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's nothing like coming next. <laughs> a great picture. Nice. That is a beautiful picture. <clears throat> right behind that sail, uh, what you can see here, uh, this is a uh, hatch. And, and it closes. This would this part mm -hmm. up here would actually be the surface, but this is a watertight hatch. There you can see the wheel that seals it up. Mm -hmm. And that would uh, go into the missile compartment. So you go down a ladder and you would enter into the, the missile compartment. Um, yeah, next. Uh, when you retire, they don't want you back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did not have that many gold. Stripes. Yeah, stripes. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's been in much longer than I was. Next. Yeah, that's mine. That's mine. Next. Okay. <laughs> Dad, which submarine movie is the most accurate? So what you have up there is a DOS boot. Uh huh. All right. Uh, October. Okay. One silent run deep. Crimson Tide, <coughs> down periscope. Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah. The sea view from Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Yeah. So, uh, kids, my my kids, many of adults have asked, um, which one is the most accurate of submarine life? Well, they show you the strategic part of operating submarines, they don't tell you the, the amount of fun that we have while we're out there. So, uh, Das Boot, uh, diesel World War II submarine, uh, German, uh, where you had to, to submerge the ship, you had to have the whole crew run forward to, to get enough weight up there to take the submarine down. Um, uh, those kind of things. Uh, Hunt for Red October, uh, a Russian captain with a Scottish accent. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, the submarine service's answer to Top Gun uh, without Kelly McGillis. And uh, some parts of each of those two movies are, are accurate. Uh, Run Silent, Run Deep is a story of uh, Clark Gable is a submarine captain who's very, very hard-nosed. Uh, and there were... Um, captains and supervisors that I worked for in the Navy that were very, very hard-nosed. Um, and he just drilled his crew relentlessly, uh, but very successful submarine operations in the movie uh, during World War II. Um, sea view, um, there are no windows on a submarine. Um, uh, there you go. Uh, and though we don't come out of the water quite at that angle, let alone with icebergs around. Um, down periscope, uh, I'll come back to that. And, uh, <laughs> Crimson, Crimson Tide. Um, oh my goodness, uh, one person can launch uh, nuclear missiles uh, from a submarine. And, and uh, you can lose control and, and um, no, no. Um, it, it takes uh, messages, it takes three keys. Uh, to be engaged to launch missiles off of a submarine. Um, we wouldn't launch unless we had verification from, from many different sources and so on. So, um, and, and no, captains never brought dogs aboard uh, the submarine. Um, other things, but... Uh, <laughs> so, back to down periscope. <coughs> Dad, which, which movie is most accurate of the submarine service? Um, because of the characters? Because of the, you, you do anything to keep the submarine operational? Because of the uh, personalities that you go to sea with? I would tell you that day-to-day -day life 
on a submarine was more like Down Periscope than any of the other movies. Really? Because it, it is, um, it's very serious what we do. We sail around in a hostile environment, um, but um, it, it's, yeah, just the, the people aspect of it. Um, if you go out there and you're not having fun, you're going to go nuts in 90 days. And it's just, it's just so much, it is fun out there, but it's a lot of hard work as well. Mm -hmm. So a combination of all of those, but um, down periscope. Okay. Uh, some ships are designed to sink, uh, others require assistance. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the, the <coughs> motto of uh, the submarine service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, next. Uh, that's a picture of submarine racing. Uh, it's, 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 it's very intense. Um, next. Uh, yes, we are over here. Um, no, we, we think you're over there. No, we're, we're right here. Uh, Prove it positive. Next. Uh, you see who's leading the way. <laughs> Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I, uh, of anything that I wished I could have done while I was in the service, it would have been flight operations on an aircraft carrier. I think that would have been uh, just intense. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's a newer class of submarine. You saw the ones that I served on actually had sailplanes that came out of the sail up here. They're back to using bow planes again. Uh, like they did on the World War II uh, diesel submarines. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're back to using that for what they call the control services. Next. That's a Russian boat, a uh, Russian submarine. I don't know what class it is, but uh, those, those are the ones that we try to avoid and stay away what, from. What, what's the flag? Uh, wow. Mm -hmm. It's not like Russian. Iranian or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It Oh. It's not, not Russian. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, next. Um, there are uh, certain ceremonies that the submarine community does, and one of them is called the tolling of the bell. Um, at the submarine ball each year, which is the anniversary of the submarine service, um, it's what they submariners that are still on eternal patrol. But here you have a bell and you have a person that's reading the list. And what he's doing is reading a list of submarines that were lost <coughs> from the inception to uh, through, through the uh, Scorpion. Um, and so what they'll name the submarine uh, crew of 127 all hands lost. And then they'll ring the bell. And then they'll say, USS blank um, crew of 112 all hands lost and they ring the bell mm -hmm. and they go through that. It's a very solemn ceremony. <coughs> um, next slide. Here's a picture of the bell. And, uh, chief or Master Chief or somebody that's ringing the bell. Next. Mm -hmm. Um, questions? We okay you still on time, Ed? Or are we out? Just to uh, come, come to the defense of the uh, sonar girls. <laughs> <laughs> you can try. I was uh, had the honor of attending the uh, USS Colorado commissioning last weekend. Oh, I'll so stay cool. In Groton. And uh, it's an attack sub, SS and, uh, 788. Yep. Uh, contrary to what Governor Hickenlooper said, 778, twice <laughs> at the ceremony. Um, Sonar, fire control, uh, officer of the deck, and two helmsmen, I guess that's what you call them, all in the same room now. Yeah. And uh, everything's, no, no periscopes, it's a camera controlled by a Nintendo controller. <laughs> and uh, amazing sub, it, absolutely amazing. And of course we didn't get to go to the engine room except Governor Hickenlooper did. Of course. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it was an amazing ceremony. If you go to the USS Colorado Commissioning.org, I think it is, it's the group that sponsored it. 
uh, the whole hour and a half ceremony is on there. It's really, it was really cool. That was an honor. Yeah, I watched it on Facebook. Uh, I'm trying to think of probably the most interesting story. Um, USS Florida, that, go, go back to that first um, submarine. We, um, we fired the missile off the coast of Florida, and then we had to go through sound trials. And uh, so the USS Ranger, which was a special surface ship, and they had a buoy over here. And what we would do is run figure eights uh, between the buoy and the submarine. And we would just do constant figure eights. And while we were doing the figure eights, we would change lineups uh, around the submarine from ventilation to securing equipment in the engine room and doing different things. And um, so they were taking sound cuts and, and finding out where some sound may be emanating to and through the hull to make us as quiet as possible. Um, so they, they had this um, odd frequency that they kept coming up with. And so we would surface and they would have some sound technicians come on board and they were carrying handheld equipment all over the place trying to find this, this odd hertz uh, of a signal. And, uh, Somebody must have run the copying machine on that run. I mean, that, that's how um, intense it got. And they would call back and make sure we had all the lineups. And we'd do the figure eights, and that noise would come back again. And um, there was other fast attack submarines in the area to keep the area clear so that Russians weren't doing the same kind, or some enemy submarine was doing the same kind of thing. We surfaced at least three times for them to try to find this odd signal. And uh, finally, they said, go, go, go over here someplace, play around just for a second. We'll have one of the fast attacks come in and sweep the area. And they did, and they found a contact sitting underneath the ranger, oh. which left shortly thereafter <laughs> with the signature of a Russian submarine. <laughs> and they <coughs> were a very courageous captain <laughs> of a Russian submarine, <laughs> uh, trying to be very covert in, in getting those things. And uh, we went back to doing our runs, and that signal was gone. <laughs> so he had snuck in, and literally the surface ship was here, and he was down there just listening, kind of hungry, not making much noise. <laughs> but they picked up his electrical signal. <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, that, that was very interesting, and then the Russians were very interested in the USS Parchy for what the book says that it does. And um, we were a little worried going out, one, a new configuration of the submarine, and two, rumors were flying around that the Russians wanted to see us at the bottom of the ocean because they didn't want to go out doing what they <laughs> knew it was going to do. So we had escorts uh, for our, our sea trials for the Parchy as well, but it turned out to be nothing. So. Um, it's an exciting life. Um, since I have left the submarines, um, it has literally changed. The technology now uh, for operating a submarine, I would guess the, did they say what the size of the crew is going to be on the Colorado? Around 130. So the crew is going to be still about the same, but the technology. Yeah, the, um, everything's almost off the shelf. All the servers that run sonar and fire control are yeah. off shelf. Just software is what. Yep. Um, since then, uh, let's see, did they say how many women were on the crew? Well, when they did the ceremony, they had a female bosun mate when they set the first watch, and mm -hmm. people were kind of confused, but uh, she was not part of the crew, just the ceremony, but okay. none. Uh, women are, are now serving on submarines. Um, I have no doubt in their capability. I honestly think there's probably women out there that do their jobs better than some of the guys on the submarines just because of knowledge and, and, and other things. The, the logistics of it is, is what worried me um, for the crew as an entirety. The, the young people together in a confined space is what I would worry about. Um, 
and so I, I wasn't against it. I was just worried about how the logistics of everything was going to was going to work. So one of the uh, really interesting technology um, changes is that uh, captain doesn't have to be anywhere near the control room. Everything's shared throughout the ship on video. Yeah, they can show sonar plots. They can show fire control. The only thing they can't do is they can't run the helm from up there. Right. They still have to send it back. And I think uh, fire control has to be done separately. So, or not fire control, but firing the torpedoes and stuff. Yeah, that would make sense. You want some kind of human judgment in there whether to pull the trigger or not. Um, it, it, it's obvious that the submarine service has come a long way. And uh, unfortunately, we still have to have strategic weapons that go to sea. Uh, when a Triton missile submarine goes to sea, it's the third most powerful nuclear platform in the world. There's Russia, the United States, and then there's uh, a Triton missile submarine, which is kind of scary. Yeah, Dave? Do you uh, know approximately when the transition was made from Polaris to Trident? I do not. Um, I'm going to assume that it was when the Ohio was made. Hmm. That the Trident missile submarines came. 1970s. From. Let's see. She went down the river in 19 the first time. Oh gosh, 80, 81. Okay. So the, the, the that missile had to be ready to go. Uh, so I would say late 70s. Yeah. When I served on uh, the uh, Holland, which is a uh, submarine tender. Mm -hmm. We were based at Rota, Spain. We'd have submarines come in for refitting with different kinds of things that were wearing out or getting corroded and things of that nature. Yep. And we had heard back then when I was just about ready to leave that they were uh, going to be transitioning most all of the subs from Polaris into Tridents. I would assume that when the old boomers, the earlier ballistic missile submarines, as they retired, and it took, what, two Tridents to replace, or three of the old ballistic missiles, and that would, I would assume it all changed over it then. Um, I chose the submarine service while I was in boot camp. Um, they, it's something you have to volunteer for, so I had to go see a shrink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your, son, your, son, your son, I think I ought to go back. Um, but he, he just, he, he asked very simple questions. And, uh, I would tell you the <coughs> first patrol one night, I got a little anxious about where we were, what we were doing, and I went, as far aft in the submarine, I went back to shaft alley where the shaft penetrates the back end of the ship that attaches to the propeller. And I started walking. And by the time I got as far forward as I could possibly get, uh, it was the first and last time I felt any anxiousness about where I was and what I was doing. And just how big that submarine was. Um, what you see is 560 feet. Um, not quite that much on the inside of the people tank, but um, you do, you, I, we never had anybody lose it out there, you know, go bonkers or anything, um, but it, it was something that I, I volunteered for, uh, much smaller command, 125, 150 people, by 5,000 people on an aircraft carrier. And I, I would rather know most of the names than not recognize more than half the people on the ship, if you will. So. Yes, sir? First Trident was commissioned the 12th of November, 1981. USS Ohio? Yep. Yeah, I forget when the Florida was, was commissioned. I can't even tell you who broke Thank the you. champagne bottle over it, but uh, Internet works. we were there. And Greenpeace was in the river protesting. <laughs> <laughs> I served at a very interesting time, 78 to 98, and it was all of the Cold War. Um, 78 still had remnants of Vietnam, so there was protesters outside 
uh, electric boat shipyard in on the river, Greenpeace. Uh, they were throwing fake blood on on the gates and the signs at electric boat, just protesting because it was a nuclear missile submarine. Um, shortly thereafter, when we rescued Kuwait, people began to realize, don't blame the people in uniform, blame the politicians for putting them in a place. And the whole the, the whole thought press, of the, the, the whole belief system around the military changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was uh, really cool to witness and, and be a part of that. Uh, and, and that has maintained for a, a long, long time. Uh, that we still, even more so today, uh, I believe we recognize veterans in active duty uh, service. Uh, and, and to the point where we're including police and fire now. Um, into that same same realm of serving not only our country but our community. And, uh, just so proud to see that uh, come full circle um, from from where it was. Kind of a kind of a unique history. What didn't I answer for you? Yes, sir. What would be the lifespan of a submarine? Uh, Florida was commissioned. I'm going to guess 83 ish, um, and it's still in service today. I think, I, think, I, think, I think they said the Colorado was scheduled to serve for 33 years, something like right. that. Yeah. It, it's, uh, they're cool. <laughs> it's a totally different lifestyle. But I, I loved it. And, and um, I do it again today. I'm just too, way too old to keep up with those young sailors. <laughs> I don't know that I can pass the PT test anymore. <laughs> Let alone my knees take the uh, the, the decking and uh, my ankles. They might have been worn out prematurely. What else? All right. What a pleasure. Thanks. All right. Guys. Thank yep. you. All right, any, you guys have any individual questions for Jerry? And I brought a couple books here that, that uh, may have some interest for you. Uh, stick around, check out the museum, and, and uh, thanks again for coming.